All right, we're good. So uh, we are going to look at uh, this PowerPoint we looked at yesterday. Okay, so I want to go to the beginning of this PowerPoint. And it says we, and you can help me as we go through this or whatever. We're talking about these three Muslim empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the Mughal Empire. And the first thing we talked about, and we're kind of zeroing in on the Ottoman Empire, we said that the Ottoman Empire was the most durable Muslim empire. And I gave you a time frame for that. What was our time frame for that? 1300 to 1922. And so we mentioned yesterday that this, this Muslim empire, the Ottoman Empire, was such a long-lasting empire. What's like the ma last major world event they went through? World War One, right? So that's like a that's a, an impressive empire, and it says on the handout that it was a massive land-based empire. I mentioned to you yesterday that there's two types of empires: there's land-based or sea-based. And I gave you the example of like Portugal and Spain as sea-based empires, because Portugal is not a big country, but they made a really wise decision. <clears throat> they decided to like invest in their navy, and they ended up sailing along Africa's coast. <clears throat> they ended up making it to India. They made up having colonies in Brazil where they, what did they grow for income in Brazil? Sugar, right? So that's a sea-based empire. Like Portugal didn't conquer their neighbors. Portugal didn't like take over Spain. Portugal built a navy, sailed around the world, and made a ridiculous amount of money. But guess who else did that? Well, the English did that. There were 13 English colonies. The Dutch did that. They became one of the most important trading empires in the world. The Spanish did that. The French did that. So it seems like after 1500, like the best thing you could do is invest in your navy. The Ottoman Empire is not a sea-based empire. It's a land-based. I mean, it's pretty impressive. I mean, they have three continents they control. They control part of North Africa. They control the Middle East of Asia. They control part of Europe. But that's not going to be the wisest choice after 1500. It says on the handout also, <clears throat> we know that you have a choice religiously. If you're a Muslim, and what choice did this empire, what were they religiously? They're Sunni. That's the majority 75, 80% of the Muslim world is Sunni. The average Muslim you'll meet will be Sunni, and that's who the Ottoman Empire are as well. And it says that they did not understand the importance and need for sea power after 1500, while Portugal and the Netherlands and Spain and England and France were all doubling down on their, their sea power presence, their, their navies, we don't see the exact same importance on the Ottomans. We also mentioned to you that ethnically they were made up of a group of people that were called the Turks, right? In fact, on this map, everything in yellow, everything here is areas where the Turks live. Uh, there's countries that still to this day bear the name, like the, 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 the country Turkmenistan. But more famously, I mentioned to you yesterday, it was like the home of the home. Turkey, right? Like, that's where we get our name from. So ethnically, we mentioned that these people were Turks, ethnic Turks. We also talked about the fact that before this Ottoman Empire was a thing, there was a previous empire, a, a Byzantine Empire. Good job, Amy. And with the fall of Constantinople, it brought an end to the Byzantine Empire under this guy, Sultan Mehmet II. And this is one of the most famous buildings in the Byzantine Empire. This was a church, Hagia Sophia. And we mentioned that after this city and the Byzantine Empire fell, they took the church of Hagia Sophia and they turned it into a into a mosque. In fact, you can see there's Arabic now symbols decorating this building. And what was once a Christian church now became a mosque as the Byzantine Empire, the old Roman Empire goes away and the Byzantine Empire comes into existence. 
So we have these three empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid, and the Mughal. And even though all three are Muslim, they all three don't get along. In fact, who is the rival of the Ottoman Empire? The Safavids, right? And the reason they're rivals has to do with religion. Though they all believe in Muhammad, they all believe in the Quran, they all believe in Hadith, there's a difference. What is the difference between the Ottomans and the Safavids? Yes, for constant enemy, the constant enemy of the Ottoman Empire is the Safavid Empire. The reason they're enemies with the Safavids is the Safavids are Shia. The Safavids are Shia. That's their constant enemy, fellow Muslims. One of the things that you should know about the Ottoman Empire is like how big it is. In fact, there's a guy named Suleiman the Magnificent. And he's important because he actually expanded Islamic conquest into, you'll write down, southeastern Europe. So, that's great, into southeastern Europe. So, that's on the map. That's, that's on the screen, you know. Uh, this right here, this is southeastern Europe on the map. And these are white Europeans who, what religion would they be if you're a white person from Europe? You're going to be Christian. Remember, there's two types. There's there's three types of options. There are Roman Catholic, generally in Western Europe. There's Eastern Orthodox, generally in the Eastern part. And there's new kids on the block, Protestants. They're generally going to be in Northern Europe. So what kind of Christians would these people will most likely be? Eastern Orthodox. Like, Protestants are, like, way up here, like in Germany, way up here in the Netherlands, in England. These people are Orthodox, mainly, and they get, they get taken over. Um, so Europe has had a, a, a significant experience with Muslims because this isn't the first time part of Europe's been taken over by Muslims. This is southeastern Europe, but what southwestern two countries had been taken over by Muslims by, for two, 700 years. Yeah, so on the other side of this map, which we can't see right now, Spain and Portugal have been taken over by Muslims for seven, from 711 to 1492. The, 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 the Spanish just wrapped that up in 1492. That was called the Reconquista, when they were reconquering, retaking back Spain and Portugal. And now that they've kicked out the Muslims from the southwestern part of Europe, the southeastern part of Europe gets taken over by Muslims. So that's kind of a bummer for these, these Europeans. And they even try to get as far as a city called Vienna in 1529, which was, I mean, I, I, I mean, that is like the city. And it was saved only by the winter. You know, it was too cold for the Ottoman Empire to continue. The snow was too much. It was saved only by winter. Vienna is a major European city. Vienna is a major European city. And had they taken Vienna, they could have pushed all the way into Germany, into Austria, into land owned by the Habsburgs. Maybe we wouldn't have those sausages today. So Vienna was barely saved. So now I want to talk about two cities. I'm going to talk about or one European city and the Ottoman Empire more broadly. Yeah, saved only by winter, you know, only because of like the storms, only because of the snow, only because of the conditions. That's the only thing that really ultimately made the big difference for Vienna. That's just an example of like how close Europe came to being taken, dominated more by these Muslim forces. So now it says Ottomans and Venice. What modern European city is Venice in? What modern European city do we find Venice? What, I didn't hear what you said. What did you say? Italy. Yeah, like if you saw Spider-Man Far From Home, the first place that Peter Parker goes to on his senior year trip to Europe, he goes to Venice. And even if you don't know anything about Venice, when you think in your mind about Venice, what's weird about their roads or whatever? Oh, it's, it's all water. It's like all water, right? 
it's like they have canals and they have gondolas, they have these boats that they use. That's what it's like. So if your city is like you have canals for streets and it's like concrete or fancy buildings, do you think there's going to be like a lot of farming going on there? No. So Venice is, is here in Italy, in this like upper pocket of Italy. This is the Adriatic Sea. Okay, so I'm not going to do farming. What can I do if I'm wonderfully located here? I could fish, and, and there is that. But I could do something better, more lucrative than fishing. Trade. And if I'm a European, wonderfully located here, who can I trade with that Europeans have been interested in trading with for a long time? Yeah, why? What do the Muslim Ottomans have that white Europeans are interested in? Sugar, what else? Coffee. I mean, I could literally, I could literally stop right there with coffee because it's so good and amazing. Like, but we could go on sugar, uh, textile, other products. So I am in the best location possible. And so it says on your handout that the Ottomans and Venice have a mutually beneficial relationship. They have a mutually beneficial relationship. They can help one another. The Italians, I'm going to be able to trade with you. I'm going to be able to get your products. I'm going to be able to sell it for hire because that's what I'm going to do. You know, all white Europeans, they want pepper. They want spices. They want sugar. And I, and Ita I'm happy to do that for you. I'm going to go to the Muslim world. I'm going to bring it. And what am I going to do to the price of those goods? I'm going to raise it up because I am a middleman. I'm going to make a lot of money off my fellow Europeans. It says on your handout that this mutually beneficial relationship was at times adversarial, though it was also based on trade, as we mentioned, based on trade. Venice, on your handout, was an important middleman, an important middleman. And a middleman is someone, it's literally your job just to deliver the goods. And you raise the price. If you order Uber Eats on Sunday because it's the Super Bowl, there's, you know, it costs so much for wings and pizza. But then you're going to pay another $9 to get it delivered, right? For the, for the you know, because I can't make it for maybe your, your parents aren't home and you don't have a car or you can't whatever. I, I'll pay more to get it to me. And the middleman makes that extra money. And that's who Italy is. Italy's the middleman. And they're getting paid to deliver. They're getting paid to deliver. Now, if you don't want to spend the extra nine or ten dollars, what could you do with your wings? You just go get it yourself, right? You save the money. They serve as important middlemen, and this created vast wealth. It created vast wealth for Italy. What to do for this vast wealth in Italy? What can I do with it? Now, you might remember last year in 2020, the government did something twice that positively affected your parents' bank account? Stimulus. Stimulus checks, right? And so I think the first round of checks was the big one, and that was like in the spring, and that's when your parents brought home a new TV. <laughs> You're like, why are we getting this? Oh, it's, <laughs> I'm buying this TV not for me, it's for the country. And so I also, you know, had some purchases that were, you know, you know, some of us went on vacation. We're like, why are we, how do we afford this beach house? It's for the economy. And then right after Christmas, you might remember, there was another stimulus check that, it wasn't as big, but it was helpful because some of us went over budget on Christmas and your parents looked at you because every child was worth a $600 bonus. And when I looked at my firstborn, I said, good morning, 600, I mean, Lila, uh, it's good to see you. And so I saw all of my children's little $600 payments. And now they're thinking about a third stimulus check that could go out in the next few weeks. So your parents are again looking at you as wonderful blessings because they'll get something on some of these possible models based on how many kids they have. The check is supposed to help people who are hurting during the pandemic. However, yeah. Because some people don't have jobs. However, many people still have jobs. And it's just like, well, I mean, 
you know, I'm just going to go buy that TV from Target, you know, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> right? And so a third round is coming up. Now, so we, have decide, we have to make decisions what to do with our stimulus checks. Now, Italy has a decision to make, too. What do I do with all this money that's coming into Italy? Well, I mean, you pay the bills, first of all. But then when there's extra money. You know what we need to do with our extra money? Well, they decide, it says on your handout, that allowed for the massive Italian sponsorship of, you'll write down, the arts. Like art, like artists, like fancy people. Like, you don't need fancy art. Like, you didn't need that new TV, that new pandemic TV, but you got it anyway. And so, you know, like, there's like these, like, even if you don't know, even if you don't know what they did, like, finish this list of artists. Michelangelo, Donatello, who else? The, da Vinci was at Renaissance. Raphael. Leonardo. Yeah, all these people, like, these are people from like the Ninja Turtles, <laughs> but they're Renaissance artists, right? And so now Italy has a bunch of money, more money they know what to do. They say, you know what? We are going to sponsor fancy art. We're going to sponsor fancy sculptures and statues and paintings. That's what we're going to do with our stimulus money. It says on the handout also, if I'm a white European and I'm going to the Muslim world, I'm bringing back pepper, that's true. I'm bringing back spices, that's true. But there's something else I'm bringing back. Because you might remember that Europeans loved, 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 loved one type of European the best. But the problem was that these one type of Europeans, they used to be like really great back before Jesus was born. And they used to write amazing books. There's a guy named Aristotle. This guy was amazing. He was the best. The Europeans loved the Greeks. And they thought, man, the Greeks, back when they were, like, on their game, they were the best. The Greeks were number one. Here's Greece, by the way. But what happened to all the books that the Greeks had written that they had in Western Europe? They were destroyed. They were lost. They were gone. And so most of these Europeans like, man, I wish we had, man, why did I lose my copy of the Greeks? Why don't, why don't we be more careful with Aristotle? But it turns out, when the Italians go to the Muslim world, you know who else really liked Aristotle and who else really liked the Greeks? The Muslims did. And in places like Baghdad, a place that I've called like the Austin, Texas of the Middle East, guess what they had done with these copies of Aristotle and the ancient Greeks? They kept them, they translated it, they preserved it. And when white Europeans come to the Muslim world, they find out the Muslims have copies of their favorite books that they lost. And the Muslims give them right back. And so it says that this trade connection fueled intellectual advances. Intellectual advances. When you're hanging out with Muslims, you're going to get the best ideas from the Muslims. When you're spending time in the Muslim world, you're going to get the best ideas from the Muslim world. This fueled intellect, intellectual advances that aided a time period we call... What is that called when they started learning again and developing again in Europe? The Renaissance. If you don't know, that's R-E-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E. -S -S -E, the Renaissance. No Renaissance without Muslims helping to move ideas around. The Renaissance and, and Dar al-Islam, the Muslim world, are, are connected to one another. So it says on the handout, all of this trade and all these advances with Asia. I mean, Italy's the one making bank. Italy's the one who, like, they're the ones in charge. They're the ones bringing it to Europe. They're the ones making the money. But if you're the rest of the Europeans, you're kind of like feeling like we're getting gypped. Like, I'm getting played, right? Like, I'm buying pepper from you for, like, way more than you get it from. And, like, your cities are, like, really nice. So it says on the handout that this control of trade with Asia by these two powers, by Italy, by the Ottomans, it encouraged other Europeans to think about their options. In fact, what I want you to write, what I want you to write down is it caused these other Europeans to turn to the Atlantic for trade. 
to turn to the Atlantic for trade. And I'm going to give you an example. The example I'm going to give you is the example of Portugal. So on this map on the screen, here's Italy. Italy's in the middle, perfect location for them to go from here to the Muslim world. They're going to make bank. But here's Portugal. Portugal is literally as far away from the Middle East as you can get. Italy's right there. Italy's right in the middle. Man, Portugal's out in the far, far, far west. They're going to pay some pretty high prices for that Uber driver to deliver it from the Middle East to West Europe, right? There's like a plus, plus nine fee there, right? So Portugal's like, well, I want pepper and I want spices. How can I get this without the Uber delivery fee? Well, how about this? We know Africa's here. What if we sail the coast of Africa? And what if we go to India directly and then make it back? Now, that seems like a great, like, how is that better than just dealing with Italy? How is it better for me to sail around Africa to cross the Indian Ocean and then come back? It was still cheaper. When they did that, they were still getting pepper cheaper than buying it from the Italians. And you know what? I'm not putting a single dollar more in the pocket of the Italians. They were jacking that price up. Baby numbers. I, so I'm going to tell you quickly, I don't know. But that's a great question. Yeah, so I'm going to say, I don't know. Short answer. Great question, I don't know. But what can Portugal now do if they directly went there and brought back all the spices and pepper? What can they do now also? They can start selling it. They can sell it to other people too. So now that's Portugal. And then remember Portugal, they took over Angola. We talked about this. This was the only part. Who were the only white people to take over Africa early on? It was the Portuguese. We looked at a video of them going to Port uh, to Angola where they speak Portuguese to this day. What about Spain? Spain is right next to them. Uh, Spain wants money too, right? But they can't do the whole, let's go around Africa, because, you know, they're, they're, the Portuguese are already doing that. So what is the Spanish solution to get access to spices? If they want to go to India, they want to go to the Indies, but they can't go around Africa. What does one guy say we should try doing? We should do what? Oh, we should make, like, go around the world. Hey, we all know the world's a sphere. Let's sail west, a guy named Chris Columbus says. And I'm sure we can make it to the, 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 to the Eastern Hemisphere. I'm sure we can make it to the Indies. Like yeah, so he miscalculated the size of the Earth. And these islands kind of look like all these islands to Chris Columbus. So he says, oh, I made it. There's brown people here. They're, they're, they're Indians. And he was, of course, wrong. But the reason Spain did that was to not have to deal with the Italians. The reason why Portugal did this was so not to deal with the Italians. And not in the way that we did. And not without the Muslims also, you know, introducing white people to sugar and pepper. I mean, imagine not having any spices on in your food. I mean, I will go on a boat to India for that. You know, like, get me the spice rack. So it says on your handout that the Ottoman Empire did not fully see the importance uh, of maritime commitments outside of the Mediterranean Sea. Outside the Mediterranean Sea. So Italy and the Ottoman Empire, they're making a lot of money here in the, in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. They're making a lot of money here in the Mediterranean Sea. Why would I want to look anywhere else? Well, you really need to, because in our last chapter, there's something called the Atlantic Circuit. Is there a lot of money to be made in Brazil and the islands and the 13 colonies? Is there a lot of money to be made here in the Atlantic Circuit in the chapter we just studied? There is a lot of money. In fact, there's so much money. How many black Africans did I move across the Atlantic Ocean? Because there's so much money to be made. Eight million people. Eight million, 
eight million enslaved Africans removed because there's so much money to be made. Listen, if I want to be where the money's at, I need to be part of the Atlantic Ocean. But these people are stuck in the Mediterranean, which was like cool in the Middle Ages. But if you had to choose between trade in the Mediterranean or trade in the Atlantic Ocean, you know what every European country is going to say? Sign me up. That's where the real money's at. Below that, the Ottomans and the Portuguese, you see where it says the word, the words were ultimately left? Cross out the word were. I don't need it there. So it should just say ultimately left now. Make sure that line says it ultimately left the Europeans unchallenged in the Indian Ocean. It left Europeans unchallenged in the Indian Ocean. They didn't see Europeans as a big of a threat as they should have. They didn't see Europeans in the Indian Ocean as, oh, watch out for these people. I mean, really, the Indian Ocean Trade Network had never been fought over. There was never wars. There was never colonies. There was never empires. What, what, what could happen? What could go wrong with some white people showing up in little boats with guns? What's the worst that could happen? But what happened to the Indian Ocean because of white people, the Portuguese, showed up with guns? What happened to the Indian Ocean? They took it over. They claimed little Portugal, this ridiculously small country, claimed everything in blue as their personal property. And they stopped ships, ships that have been sailing for a thousand years peacefully. They're super chill, going back and forth, monsoon winds. No problems, no crime here. And all of a sudden, the Portuguese show up with guns and say, hey, trade with us or we're going to, uh, we're going to kill you. Man, that escalated quickly. You know, like, that, I mean, you went from a nobody country that I have not even mentioned this semester to one of the most important countries on planet Earth. Because you put your money in, an, in, a, in a navy. Everything in blue. You have your ships sailing and working. It says on the handout, uh, there's a vocabulary term, Battle of Lepanto. Would you put a star by that? Use your textbook to tell me about that. Who fought in it? Why is it important? Why is that even a term on a handout? Make sure you do that. When I check your notebook next Friday, this is going to be one of, the ten, uh, one of the things I'll be looking for. If you have a blank, I'm going to take points off. Well, we have mentioned before that we're going to have two major grades in six weeks, a multiple choice test and a notebook grade. If you look at Amy, she has a notebook, and all the handouts that we do and we get graded and get handed back are going to be on the notebook check. So ideally, what grade should you get on the notebook check? 100, right? Now, next week, I'm going to give you a checklist. I'm going to say, these are the 10 things you need. And if you have 8 of those 10, guess what grade you'll probably get. Now, if you have 8 of the 10, but there's like a bunch of blanks, then you might get a 78 or a 77. So in general, you should have a set list of notes. I'm going to have a checklist for you. And you'll fill it out. And I want you to have it in like a binder or like what Amy has. If you don't have $2 to get a three-ring binder from Walmart, let me know. And I'll work with you and we'll make something happen. But I don't want like Samantha to hand me a pile of like 10 papers and say, here you go. Because I'm going to take points off Samantha's quote unquote notebook because it's just Samantha's pile of papers she randomly, you know, pulled out of her note, her, her bag. Okay. I have a hole puncher. We can use it. We can work together. And it can be magical. So do Battle of Lepanto. Next, central institutions. There's a word you should know called a janissary. So I have an empire, and you know what I need to do to make an empire work? I kind of need, like, an army, but sometimes you don't get, like, enough volunteers for the army. Like, in our Vietnam War, what did we do to solve our no-one-is-volunteering-to-go-to-Vietnam problem? The draft. So for the Ottoman Empire, they have a solution, too, but their solution is not as kind as the draft. It's actually, let's get a bunch of slaves and make them part of the army. We saw a video this week about enslaved Africans in India, and you might remember that the main job enslaved Africans had in India was to serve in the military, right? 
this is actually a really good example of how different Atlantic slavery is versus Islamic slavery. If you're a black man in Alabama, what kind of work are you probably going to be doing? You're going to be working agriculture, farming, breaking your back, hot sun, working way too many hours. That's common in the Atlantic world, common in North and South America. But in Muslim slavery, if you're a male slave, you're probably going to be like in the military. These are two very different things. We're never going to see really slave soldiers in the Christian Atlantic world. We'll write down that a Janissary are Christian slave soldiers. That's what Janissaries are, Christian slave soldiers. And these Christian slave soldiers are going to be given a brand new technology. In fact, on this picture, there are some Janissaries. What are these four Janissaries holding? They're holding guns. Now, why would I give a Christian soul, uh, why would I give a slave the latest technology? That doesn't sound smart, but it is smart. It's smart because guns early on, first generation guns, they're, they're deadly, uh, they're powerful, but you know what? They have a tendency, because the technology is not perfected, of doing something, you know, one out of every 10, one out of every 20 times. It backfires. And this gun might backfire and fail, and you just lost a finger. You know, if you're putting up a rifle to your face to aim, and it backfires, you might damage your eye or your face. And if you are a fancy Ottoman, like there's this guy here on a horse, and you're like rich, and you're important, and you're like got a title, I don't want my eye to be like, you know, damaged. I don't want to lose my hand. Who should we give this new technology that you might lose a hand or an eye or mess up your face? Let's give it to that that slave kid, you know. Hey, slave kid, I got something for you to do. That's why these slaves are given guns. But what's going to happen to the gun technology as time goes on? It's going to improve. So maybe you start off as a slave at age 15. Guns are kind of, kind of, you know, kind of shady. You know, like oh, I don't know about this. Ten more years, you're 25. Guns got better. Ten more years, you're 35. Guns got better. Ten more years, you're 45. Guns got better. And all of a sudden, guns went from it's like a cool thing and all, but can't really fully rely on them to, man, this is the best thing our army has. And the only one who knows how to use these and, and does use them are slaves. What's that going to do in the Ottoman Empire? Their guns are gonna, the, the slaves are going to have an advantage. And before guns, you see this guy, the fancy guy, he's riding a what now? These guys on the horses used to be the most important. Because, you know, like, if you're on a horse and you're fighting someone not on a horse, like, you have all the advantage. But over time, these guys with guns, slaves, janissaries, are going to be more important than this fancy guy on a horse. Now, imagine, Cameron, what, what sport do you do? Okay, so not a real sport. Um, let me pick someone else. No, I'm just joking. It's a real sport. But let's imagine that Oh gosh, I don't. I, I guess I'll say. Okay, so what 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 do you swim in and swim? What what comp, what race do you do? Okay, hundred butterfly, right? So let's say that you're a senior and you're actually you know one of the best swimmers on the team. They need you, right? Like you're one of the top three. And there's a, a whole new class of freshmen that come in, and they they actually look to you, Cameron, to kind of like take some of these younger guys under your wing and kind of like invest in them because you're one of the best. I mean. You're, you might even get an offer to swim somewhere, you know. Uh, you may not do that, but it's, it's something that could be a real option for you if you do well in the meets this year. You're really excited about the season. So you take this young guy to your wing. He's a freshman. And, you know, he does well, you know. Uh, he's swimming well. He's competing well. But very soon, Cameron, it becomes obvious that this freshman, he's actually way better than you. And let's say there's, there's for whatever reason, Let's say there's, there's limited spots that they can have in some of these races. And actually, this freshman's better than you. And if they want to win these meets, they're going to actually enter him and not you. Even if you don't ever say it out loud, how are you going to feel about this freshman kid who's better than you? And you've been here longer. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be good. So think about this. Everyone in this slide is, everyone here is part of the Ottoman Army. 
Now, these people and horses, they've been important for hundreds of years. They're part of the club. They're, you know, all, everyone respects us. They love us. At the end of the day, we help battles get won. How are these rich Ottomans? Because you have to be rich to own a horse. How are these rich cavalry? Because you have to be rich to have the time to train. How are they going to feel about these stupid peasant slave kids who are now more important than they are? Oh, this is not good. You know, if it, the, the army is divided, the army doesn't like each other, and the army is not on the same page, this is a recipe for division, a recipe for problems. It says on the handout, new technology guns were given to slaves. New technology guns were given to slaves. And we'll also write down, this put them at odds with the cavalry. Cavalry is C-A-V-A-L-R-Y. That word cavalry means soldiers on what? On horses. So now you have, you know, people are kind of not cool with each other because of that. The cavalry. Put them at odds with the people in the cavalry. So how did these people even become slaves to begin with? There's a vocabulary word you should know. Not, not only should you know the word janissary, which is these Christian slave soldiers, but also this word dev shirmi. And so this is actually the process of getting these white Christian kids into slavery, the Dev Shermi. This is where they're going to take kids from their parents' households as a slave. You know, you're going to be a slave when you're age 10 or 8 or something like that. And it says that you're going to live with a Turkish family. So you're actually taken away from your mom and you're taken away from your dad and you're going to live the rest of your life somewhere else. And now that you're living with this other family, you're now going to receive military training. You're a slave, but you're going to be sent to military school. And as a slave, going to military school, they decided to, you know, kind of like test you and, and figure out like how smart you are. And the top 10% in education became administrators. Top 10% became administrators. For example, like if you join the Army today or the Marines today, there's a test you take to see what kind of job you get. And let's say that you do terrible in that test. What job are you probably going to have in the Army? Yeah, you're the front line. You know, here's your rifle. You know, good luck. We need you. But you're in the front line. But if you do, like, ridiculously well, particularly, like, in science and computers, what are you probably going to end up doing for your four years in the military? Yeah, something on a laptop, right? I have a friend who joined the U.S. Marine Corps, and he did so well. He worked on computers his four years. He learned how to do network engineering, connecting wireless networks and computer systems. He touched a keyboard more than a rifle in his four years in the Marines. And after that, he went on to become a network engineer, and he makes like 150000 a year without a college degree because he learned to work with computers in the U.S. Marine Corps. In the same way, these guys, these, these soldiers, these slaves, they got training, and some of them made their way up to administrators. When we watched the video earlier this week about India and enslaved Africans. Do you remember? What was the highest job some of those enslaved Africans got when they came to India? Some of them served as generals, right? <clears throat> Is that ever going to happen in the United States, in the American South, that some enslaved African in Georgia, is he ever going to become a general in the United States? No. Now, slavery is terrible, but slavery looks different in different ways. If I'm a slave in the Muslim world, I could become a general. If I'm a slave in the Muslim world, I could become an administrator. I'm still owned by someone, but I'm an influential someone myself. They could become administrators. Slavs, we'll write down, these are white European slaves. In fact, we've mentioned before that our word slave comes from the word Slav. These are white European slaves. If you ask an Ottoman in this area, what comes to your mind when you think of a slave? They say, oh, easy, a white European Christian kid that we took from his home. If I asked you what you think about when you think about slavery, you probably would not think about a white European. Our very word comes from the word Slav. And if you live with your mom, and if you have been taken from your mom and dad, what's going to happen to your religion of Christianity that you're raised in now that you're living with Muslims? 
they adopted Islam. They adopted Islam. Not only do we see that with these white European Christian kids, but what happens? We saw a video in Angola. What did they do to these enslaved Africans before they put them on the boat? They changed their name. What else? They baptized them and said, hey, you're a Christian now. So all these enslaved Africans, before they came to America, they were polytheists, they had many gods, they were animists. What does animism mean? You should know. Every one of us should know, as an AP student now in February of 2021. Animism. No. It has to do with religion. We see examples of this in the movie Pocahontas. And Pocahontas... Kind of. There's like... You, you could pray to like a sacred tree, a mountain, a hill. Animism is where you believe there's like spiritual forces in inanimate objects. Before all those Africans were put on boats to America, they were polytheists that God for this, God for that, God for the other, or they were animists. So really, uh, uh, slavery, you often adopt the, the religion of your master. We see this with these white European kids. We also see it with enslaved Africans. There is on the handout a star on the term land grant system. Make sure that you know what that is. Uh, use your textbook to fill it out, how it works and its weaknesses. What time do we get out for lunch? I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, crisis in military state, seven minutes, we have time. Technology, we'll write down, as guns improved, so did the role of slaves. As guns improved, so did the role of slaves. These janissaries became more important as guns got better. As guns improved, the role of slaves of these janissaries increased. And if someone is going to get a budget cut back, who is going to get a budget cut back? I can put money into more janissaries, more slaves, they have guns, or I can pay more for the guys on horses. Well, uh, say say your, your comment fully so I can know what you're saying. They're going to reduce. If I am going to spend less on someone, I have fancy guys on horses. They're kind of expensive because they're fancy. Or I have slaves that know how to use guns. Who will I need less of their service? Yeah. And again, like just like Cameron, I don't need Cameron anymore on the swim team because I got this like way faster freshman version of Cameron. Uh, I don't need these guys. It says there was reduction in the role of the cavalry. And again, this is going to cause all kinds of problems. If your army kind of like resents the other half, that's not a good thing. Another problem we'll write down is this word inflation. What happens to prices when you experience inflation? They go up. You might remember this an example we've studied in this class this year of inflation. There's a really rich West African man from a country called Mali. What was that guy's name? We think he's maybe the richest man in history. Mansa Musa. And he went famously on a what? trip. He performed Hajj to Mecca and he stopped off in a place called in Egypt. And what did he give away for like gifts? And he actually gave away so much gold, the value of gold it went down. Because people were like, oh, another gold ring. I've got like, a, you know, put it in the jar. I've got like a hundred of these. I mean, that's incredible. That's an example of inflation where as the value of your money goes down, the cost of products goes up. It inflates. Well, back in the 1500s, someone was responsible for flooding the market with gold and silver. Some European country made it rich and spent like there was no tomorrow. What country was that in the 1500s that stumbled upon vast amounts of gold and silver? What European country came upon ridiculous mountains of gold and silver? No. Spain. Spain. How? Why? Where? And what happened there? They just found it? Yeah, they killed Native you know, like, like It'd be like if there was like a murder scene, and you're like, I just found this gold watch. 
uh, you mean you like shot and killed a man and took it. The Spanish, because of guns, germs, and steel, took away vast amounts of gold and silver, and then they enslaved the Native Americans. They did things like the vocabulary word called the mita. They forced them to work. And now it says on your handout, Spanish silver actually bankrupted traditional elites who were bound by law to only collect a fixed amount in taxes. A fixed amount in taxes. Let me explain what I mean by this. Um, back when I was in college, I graduated college in the year 2000, which was 21 years ago. At that time, gas in Austin, Texas cost 89 cents a gallon. That was pretty great. I could fill up my tank for $10, like easy, 10 bucks. What if I said, you know what, from now on for the rest of my adult life, I'm going to always budget $10 for gas for the week. Now that's fine in the year 2000. How how well is that going to work for me in 2021? Not, not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it for $10. I messed up. If I am budgeting based on prices of 20 years ago, I'm not going to make it. And at this time, there was a law that said I can only tax X amount of money a year. That was fine before inflation. But now that prices go up, I'm kind of in a difficult situation. I have a law that says I can only collect a fixed amount in taxes that was never, we'll write down, adjusted for inflation. Never adjusted for inflation. So the fact that Spanish silver and Spanish gold is jacking up the prices, but there's a law that said I, as a landlord, can only charge X amount. I can't survive anymore. The military, the Ottomans, has turned against one another. The economy is dealing with inflation, and nature itself has turned against the Ottoman Empire. Global climate change, the Little Ice Age, created stress in the agriculture that furthered internal tension. It furthered internal tension. Not only do I hate the, re the other half of the army, not only do I have economic problems, but nature itself, I can't grow enough food, food is freezing, internal tension, people are blaming one another. Last thing, it says Janissaries and change, they became the most important part of the army. Slave soldiers became the most important parts of the army. We are going to go ahead and stop there. There are some starred items on the back, the word vizier and tax farming. You'll make sure you use your book to tell me what those things are. On Friday before the test, we'll knock out the rest of these like in five or seven minutes. We probably only need 25 minutes for the quiz itself tomorrow. Um, make sure that you take a look at the review. Uh, the review is going to help you to prepare. And I look forward, and there'll be a no more than 30 minute video posted today going over the review. Have a great day. You're the best.